Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, when I did my shuttle video, uh, when I demonstrated how to build these gorgeous looking wings and make them actually work well enough to be able to glide a, oh, glide a shuttle into landing, I didn't say anything about what to do about these weird struts, but I guess we'll just have to deal with those things. Uh, one important, one thing that you may not know, by the way, is that you can switch symmetry mode using the R key incidentally, so you can switch between mirror and radial mode. So anyway, yeah, I want to turn this into a one that will fly into space. That was what everyone said. It's okay, now, now you've shown us how to make one that can glide, can you make one that flies into space? So uh, yeah, so let's uh, start by stripping this thing down and removing all this extra internal fuel tank. And uh, let's, uh, well, let's just leave the cargo bay empty for now. Obviously, if you're going to build yourself a space plane type thing and have it attached to a tank, then you need to put down the landing gear and have a tank. So, uh, the TT-70 radial decoupler is your friend in this case. Uh, there we go, there. Bingo! And let's try that again. It's going to rotate, press C, bingo, put that there. Now, it's very tempting. I'm sure as many people are tempted to just go and say, hey, let's put on a Rockamax Jumbo. The iconic orange tank that you, many of you will remember from actual shuttle flights. This is very, uh, well, this is obviously quite capacious for uh, fuel, but there's one thing, there's a, it's a better way to, uh, a better way to do it is to actually use sections of these Rockamax tanks. And the reason is, when the fuel drains from these, the fuel uh, mass is concentrated at the center, right? So if you build a multi-section tank, it's much easier to connect the fuel line to a specific location and then have the fuel flow, uh, you know, have the center of mass more easy to control. So if I, I think it's actually pretty good to uh, connect the fuel tank from the bottom. The reason is, if I bring up the center of mass, right, as the fuel burns down, right, the center of mass will tend to move towards the rocket, and your engines will be kind of firing through this in this direction, see the direction the mouse is moving? Well, if you drain the fuel from the top, then that will mean the center of mass of the tank moves forwards, so this center of mass will possibly kind of go this way, uh, it's hard to tell, right? But the center of mass of the spacecraft will actually move forwards a little, so you'll have it moving this way. But if you drain from the back, the center of mass will still move this way, but it should move downwards a little, which is closer to the direction vector of the engines. Anyway, uh, if you're going to use engines, everyone wants to use three engines, and the obvious ones would be the LVT-45s, uh, because they are gimballed engines, and therefore they will provide you some control by uh, flexing themselves, uh, by adjusting their you know, thrust vector, and thereby making your spacecraft easier to control. And uh, he easy enough, you can actually see, let's just turn these off, turn these off. Have I got a fuel tank now? Uh, you know, my staging is all wrong, that's what it's complaining about. So let's bring these down into this stage here. So I've got mechanical jeb here just to provide me with delta V estimates. One thing to notice is that with this tank and these three engines, you get a thrust to weight ratio of 0.77. This actually turns out to be a big problem. Using the 1.25 meter engines, these are not going to give you enough thrust, so uh, you're going to be in trouble here. Now, if you want to stick with the 1.25 meter engines, the obvious replacement is the LVT-30s. These lack the gimballing, but uh, they do have more thrust and lower mass. So once again, I have to adjust the staging on these, but uh, you'll see that I get oh, a better thrust to mass ratio, yeah, 0.84 now. And, uh, you know, that helps in terms of mass. So, uh, that, it is actually borderline possible to get this into space, but truthfully, you're better uh, abandoning the purity of the spatial design and instead uh, using four rocket engines. And that actually gives you a reasonable thrust to weight ratio. Now, obviously, I haven't pointed, I haven't aligned these or anything just yet. I will get to that. 
now, in terms of solid rocket boosters, if you want to have the classic space shuttle design with solid rocket boosters, the only one you can use is the S1 SRB KD25K. Yes, that's uh, basically the biggest solid rocket booster we have. And it does turn out to be kind of not quite as much as we would like, but let's just slap them on here for a minute so we can get an idea of what our... Uh, what our staging and everything looks like. So I'm dragging this over, dragging all the engines down into the first stage. I haven't aligned anything, this is entirely so that we can figure out if we get enough Delta V. Total Delta V 414, it's not nearly enough. Uh, I have disabled uh, monoprop here, right, so that we're not, oh, there we go, disable that as well. So once we get into space, the idea is we would use these. So we can actually turn on the monoprop and that gives us an extra 400 meters per second. So hey, 4,603, that's definitely in the range. If I disable this one or enable this one, now we get five kilometers per second. So in theory, this is pretty good. It has solid thrust to weight ratio all the way through its launch. It has enough delta V when you inc include the orbital maneuvering system or OMS. One thing it does lack is thruster gimballing. And the best way I've found to do that, uh, to, to emulate that, is to use a pair of uh, Werner engines, right? So I'm just going to stick this on the bottom here just so you can see where it goes. Oh, that wasn't supposed to go inside there. So much for that cunning plan, and now my space plane is falling apart. Ah, undo, undo, let's do this again. Let's put this on here. So you can create little uh, Werner thruster clusters here, using the Werner engines on the, on the struts, there we go. Cubic octagonal strut one on one side. Let's just not that way there we go on one side then grab that and stick it on the other and now you can oh yes uh, now in theory you can grab that if you're not a complete uh, if you don't make terrible mistakes and you can stick them on the end here duplicate them so that gives you um, control vectoring which is powered by the liquid fuel so it's slightly closer to the truth than using an RCS system but it's still not perfect let's say you can obviously duplicate this as much as you need to help maintain control this will this uh, tail skirt will actually help you go in a straight line uh, but more importantly what you're gonna have to do is adjust these solid rocket boosters so that they are more or less aligned with this mass, a uh, center of mass here. And you can do that using the offset tool. I said you can do that using the offset tool, thank you. And slide things, and that's a good start there. Then of course we have to adjust the engines, and for that you're gonna use the rotation tool. And use holding control to get smooth rotations. And you're going to figure out roughly where those things go. And in theory, you will have a thing that flies into space. Okay, so I've built my spacecraft. And I forgot to strut everything. Well, so much for theory. Uh, yeah, I also got my staging messed up a little as well. Uh, but hey, it does appear to be flying mostly under control, which is completely not what I'd expect. However, I'm pitching, so let's roll over and see if I can make it pitch in the opposite direction. So if you have a spacecraft which is consistently pitching up or down, then you can sometimes get around that problem by rolling it. That doesn't appear to be the case in this case. We appear to be consistently getting more and more extreme. Let's uh, fire up the reaction control system. Turn on the valve so that the fuel can start coming. Okay, now we're still going up but we're starting to come down now. We're on our way down back to terra firma, uh, or at least we would be going back to terra firma if we weren't flying over the ocean. We're coming back to aqua firma because 
well the you know water is pretty firm when you hit it at you know a couple of hundred miles per hour okay I think I need to somehow figure out how to get out of this because pitching one way or another isn't gonna work I could detach yeah yeah I figure that's gonna happen yeah bye okay well as I said that was theory let's uh, let's keep working on this theory now many of you may find it hard to believe, but things don't always work first time for me. Just because I know the theory doesn't mean I can actually make these things work. Like for example there, that would have been great if I'd actually managed to deploy the landing gear in time. I don't know, I continue trying to make this thing balanced. Now you'll see that uh, this one decides to go down once again and ditching the space, <laughs> ditching that leaves me with nothing but deploy the landing gear and survive. What are the odds of that? They're pretty darn remote. It's actually, you know, these, these things are fun because they let me actually see the explosions which I don't tend to see a lot of normally. So I moved the, I moved the tank a little further out to try and adjust the way the center of the mass flew. I uh, successfully ditched those after I realized things were going wrong. Time to ditch the external tank as well. And now try to get this thing under control so I can land it. Note the very high offset relative to the velocity vector here as I'm trying I'm turning very hard trying to get this thing turned enough that I won't land and go straight into the ocean, but it is not too Oh well. Back to the drawing board, back to the good old theory. The most important thing is to stand by the words of the crew of the Galaxy Quest. Never give up, never surrender. And uh, yeah, try and avoid giant clumping, chumping, smashing machines that blow things up. So yeah, um, another attempt here to get the thing down safely using the RCS thrusters to accelerate me, keep myself going fast enough, and land it in more or less one piece. There, uh, that is my least unsuccessful mission so far. I mean, I must say, when you are pushing the limits of the game and yourself, judging yourself by the least unsuccessful mission is completely valid and acceptable. So once again, ditch the, get ready to ditch everything, aha, it warns me I can't deploy the parachutes at this altitude, which is why they probably just went straight into the ground, and uh, why I follow it. Thankfully the crew capsule survives owing to some sort of miracle. There it is, little uh, unicycle skipping its way down the hillside, but the crew will walk again and they will come back for another attempt at this. And it's a good thing because after all those failures, I eventually got everything in the right place. I got all the stuff angled and this is my final orbiter, at least the one that I managed to make work. So uh, you'll note that I immediately pull back because those engines are uh, offset. You kind of want to point your nose towards the direction you're moving to make sure that you want, you're not actually going to be going, picking up velocity going retrograde. So yeah, lean back just a bit and then uh, let your velocity, let those engines kind of balance each other up out and push yourself upwards rather than sideways. Of course, when I say balance, I'm really uh, more or less fighting, furiously fighting for control of this. There's the little Werner engines hidden inside the engine cowling there. We've of course got four of those uh, engines on here. You know, the thing with Kerbal Space Program is the stock engines uh, in the 1.25 meter, there isn't anything more powerful than that than that uh, LVT-30, right? If you want to go more powerful, you have to go to two and a half meter engines, and then that just looks silly. It doesn't look like a space shuttle anymore, does it? Okay, so we're arching over and we're starting to get up to uh, SRB burnout. As soon as that happens, we want to make sure we don't lose control. And getting very, very close. Here we go. There we go. Ditch them. Clean separation. Excellent. Oh, a little bit of bump on the way down, but we are now going to continue into orbit. 
Now at this point it is more or less being flown like a regular rocket so I'm just going to time accelerate my way through most of this. Again you've got to remember that your velocity vector and your thrust vectors aren't aligned so I'm upside down which means that my thrust vector is actually higher than my nose is pointing which is actually a pretty good way to fly. I'm obviously watching my time to apple apps and making sure that it's continuing to increase. If it ever starts to decrease then you're not gaining altitude fast enough. So uh, picking up speed, burning down the fuel, but what happens is that uh, as my fuel levels drop I get more and more torque on the spacecraft so I actually have to throttle back the engines to make sure that the spacecraft doesn't end up rotating and at the end you're using about one third thrust but that was the best way I could make this thing balance out. So we burn out all our fuel, ditch the fuel tank and it's time to switch over to those RCS engines which means all I need to do is enable this. It'd be really nice to get action groups able to control that. The RCS thrusters are firing and I'm starting to pick up speed into orbit. Uh, this has, after a bit of work, I gave this thing a lot more uh, monopropellant than I think it really needed, but without the monopropellant I would have had a hard time getting into orbit. The real space shuttle had about a thousand feet per second of delta V from its orbital maneuvering system. And that's actually more or less what I end up with after this. Obviously, again, this is all running at around four times regular speed because this, this is quite slow. We accelerate up, we get our... Uh, you can see the periapsis is, of course, rising slowly and I'm keeping my nose high enough that the uh, orbit isn't starting to fall back. Although, having the orbit start to fall back to the planet is perfectly legitimate. Real spacecraft do, in fact, do this. Anyway, once that we're high enough, or once the apoapsis is high enough, it's time to just cruise up to altitude. Now, one other distinction between this and the, re the shuttle's orbital maneuvering system was that the OMS engines were actually mounted quite high up in the fuselage. So they would be angled down. Uh, you know, the, the space shuttle controls would actually tell you which uh, where your thrust vector was and the, depending upon which engines were used your thrust vector was different. I don't have those instruments I just have to guess but that doesn't matter because I have everything lined up through my center of mass and through my pointing vector and there I am into orbit with my space shuttle. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.